I am Michael Haley Goldman. If I haven't had, had a chance to meet you already, I am the Executive Director of New Hampshire Humanities. I'm so excited to start a new season of Humanities at Home. Um, this is kind of a kickoff for a couple of things um, that are really exciting. One, new, the Humanities at Home is really kind of in its second season um, as a monthly online program. And uh, we're really excited that we're going to bring you a lot of amazing stuff through Humanities at Home this year. We're going to be having the talk tonight called Beginning at the End, Andrew Krivox the Bear and Post-Apocalyptic Fiction in the American Century. This also is the first big public program supporting the New Hampshire Big Read. If you haven't already seen all of the stuff about the Big Read that we've sent out, um, it is a initiative of the National Endowment of the Humanities in partnership with Arts Midwest. And it's a statewide reading of the same book, Andrew Kirvox, The Bear. And it's basically an opportunity for us to get together and broaden our understanding of the world and our communities and ourselves in, uh, through the power of shared reading. So we aren't doing this alone. And I'm gonna read this because I know I don't tend to read, but we have a lot of amazing partners in this, including the Center for the Book at the New Hampshire State Library, New Hampshire State Council for the Arts, New Hampshire Public Radio, New Hampshire Department of Corrections Family Connection Center, 50 local libraries and community organizations. I will not name all of them, but you can find them on our website. Uh, the McAuliffe Shepherd Discovery Center, Gibson's Bookstore, Individual Scholars, and basically it's gonna be something happening all over the state with about 5,000 of your uh, fellow Granite Staters. So we're hoping you'll join in on this. This is the first step in that, really helping set the context of the big read. Tonight, we're having Dr. Brent Ryan Bellamy, and he's going to explore how post-apocalyptic novels use endings and the persistence of things to represent cultural conflicts and hopes for a better world. And we really appreciate that Brent is going to be looking at the book, The Bear specifically. Um, and we are um, you know, excited to kind of have that larger context. It's in the context of the American century. This is the period that is marked by the United States global dominance following World War II and the corresponding fears about its decline. Um, during that time, there's been a proliferation of post-apocalyptic uh, post novels. Sorry, end of a Friday. I'm not quite getting that phrase right down. Um, even though these novels start at a moment of catastrophe, they're not about the end of the world. So even if you're not a fan of post-apocalyptic, there's a lot of really interesting things going on with that. I do want to remind you that this program has been brought to you uh, in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, as well as the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, last year, through uh, National Endowment for the Humanities and donations by uh, and from people like you, we have been able to support more than 500 programs, reaching almost 20,000 people across the state, all 10 counties, and most importantly, working with 217 organizations, probably groups in your own neighborhood. So as you're looking for things to do, um, keep in mind that we are probably doing uh, amazing humanities programs right in your own backyard. If you want to find more about these programs, figure out how to sign up for a book group uh, with the bear uh, or help support more programs like this, please visit our website, www.nhhumanities.org um, and learn more about what's going on. So uh, we do um, have rules of civil dialogue when you're putting in questions or, or putting in comments in the chat. Um, we expect civil dialogue to be kind of the, the rule of the road. Um, basically any comments, uh, questions typed in chat or expressed verbally, uh, are going to be based on the program and further productive conversation. So, you know, basically use common sense as you uh, join in the discussion. And I do want to make sure you're all comfortable with Zoom. Um, we have enabled closed captioning. There will be sound during this program. We had problems with sound in a previous program. Um, and as far as we've been able to trace back, that has to do with what version of Zoom you happen to be using at this moment. So there's not a lot we can do with it if it's not playing. The good news is, it's not jazz this time, it's going to be spoken word, uh, and the closed captioning will tell you what you're missing if you're not hearing the sound. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there is also most importantly a Q&A button, um, and that button is where we will ask you any time during the program to put in questions. We'll be saving a little bit of time at the end. So that takes care of all of the business aspects of tonight. Let me introduce our amazing speaker that's joining us. Uh, Brent Ryan Bellamy is a humanities scholar who specializes in cultural studies, popular fiction, and environmental humanities. Uh, his research blends narratology and ecocriticism through a critical focus on story worlds and world building. He is recognized for excellence in teaching as well as excellence in publications. His recent publications include three books, 
Remainders of the American Century, an Ecotopian Lexicon, and 2018 Materialism and Critique of Energy. That's like three books in the last few years. So you've been quite busy. busy. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Bellamy. Thank you so much for being here. Hello, welcome. Yeah, thank I want to thank everyone for being here and especially to thank Catherine Winters Michaud, Mary Nolan, Michael Haley Goldman, and everyone else at New Hampshire Humanities. Um, I saw someone in chat ask how many people are in attendance, and uh, there are currently 70 participants here at the moment. Wow. So thank you all. This is great. This is lovely. Um, this is an overview of the talk that uh, I'm going to be giving this evening. I'll start off with a land acknowledgement, talk a little bit about post-apocalyptic storytelling. I have some examples of other novels. I thought that might be a neat way to frame my consideration of the bear. And then I am going to be talking about the bear. And just for those of you who maybe thought this was about the uh, hit TV series that just finished its second season, I mean, we could talk about that in the Q&A if you want, <laughs> but I am talking about Michael Krivak's novel, The Bear, not the, the TV series. Um, and then I have some recommended reading. So if you uh, are interested in the things that I'm talking about today, I'm going to recommend a few novels that sort of turn the post-apocalyptic uh, mode of storytelling on its head um, to close us off before the question period. If you are in New Hampshire, the odds are good that you're in, in the Kena territory, what is known as Wabanaki Donland Confederacy territory. Um, if you're not in New Hampshire, and we heard from many people uh, coming to us from all across Turtle Island, I highly recommend nativeland.ca. Um, it is a uh, website that will let you know about the traditional territories of the indigenous peoples of the various regions of Turtle Island. I am coming to you tonight from the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. In Tikaranto, I'm very close to Davenport Road, which actually used to be a game trail that cut from the northwest down to the southeast of the region. And I find it interesting in this sort of consideration of timelines and, and remainders how this uh, trail that used to exist is now running through the city, though Davenport is certainly not um, an Indigenous name for it. I'll be curious to hear if land acknowledgements have become a thing people do in New Hampshire and beyond. They have been something we in the country currently known as Canada have taken on in the past decade as a fairly consistent practice. It's a small piece of decolonization. I like to acknowledge the land that sustains me and of which I'm a part, especially at talks. Uh, the start of term um, is happening right now. And so I'll kick off my classes typically with an acknowledgement of um, the land that sustains me. This is just a small piece of that work. And uh, the hope is that it is part of an ongoing project of how to live here in a good way. I myself am a descendant of settlers. I'm in my late 30s. I have brown hair, a brown beard, and white skin. I wear glasses. I also have dyslexia, which means that I might get my words twisted. That's why I mention it anyway. And I also have general anxiety disorder, uh, which I mentioned in case I need to take a moment to collect myself. I like to share these things about my appearance and my non-appearance to support those who cannot see me and support those who have invisible conditions. Post-apocalyptic storytelling. The last two were a girl and her father who lived along the old Eastern range on the side of the mountain they called the mountain that stands alone. This is how Krivak opens the bear. And I wanted to start here before turning away from the bear because it says a lot about how this kind of storytelling works. And um, it draws on a long tradition of bringing us into these post-apocalyptic story worlds. I mean, the first three words, the last two, right? Th that has a certain weight to it. We have to kind of think about what that might mean that they were the last two. So already 
uh, prefect in the first three words is signaling to us that um, this story world is one that posits a world where there's only a couple of humans um, still alive. I then like this distinction between the old Eastern range and the mountain that stands alone because we have a kind of old Eastern range has a kind of um, folk sentimentality to it. This is something that has been passed down, what people call it. But they called specifically gestures to the girl, the girl and her father, right? That's their habit, their practice for the space. We'll come back to Prevac in a moment. But first, I want to say that when I started thinking about post-apocalyptic novels over 10 years ago, I imagined a different kind of scene. I imagined a ruined city core with little to no activity, kind of like this uh, blasted image of downtown Toronto, actually, that I have uh, as the sort of backdrop for the slides today. I thought about what Hollywood had presented in the post-apocalyptic mode. So here we could see uh, LA being destroyed in a clip from Terminator 2 Judgment Day, right? It's a vivid display, bright orange fire rushing down city streets. This is what I came to expect from Hollywood. Or on the other hand, I came to expect Kevin Costner moving from town to town across the Pacific Northwest in something like The Postman which is itself based on the post-apocalyptic novel by David Brin. Um, here, Kevin Costner stands wearing uh, really dark goggles to block out the light and a sort of assortment of garb that he scavenged. He's got a mule laden with packs and behind him in the distance, we can see rusted signs of uh, gas stations and uh, convenience stores and fast food chains. So, this is the other side of the post-apocalyptic imaginary that I've come to expect. Before this sort of multimedia explosion of the post-apocalyptic mode though, it was developed in the novel form and in short stories. The first post-apocalyptic stories were found in novels and it was as short stories and novels in the mid 20th century that the tradition was transformed into the mode that we recognize today. Post-apocalyptic novels are not about the end of the world. Instead, they represent fictional endings that may be interpreted. For me, such stories recently produced in or about the United States express cultural anxiety about the end of US dominance and the long, slow, and painful acclimatization to life under austerity, climate crisis, and an uncertain future especially for those who up to this point have enjoyed a relatively high standard of living. Characters in a post-apocalyptic situation often resort to eking out subsistence, sometimes at the expense of other su survivors and, their, and sometimes at the expense of their pre-apocalyptic habits. Such stories play out the less dramatic, yet no less impactful adjustments that many people around the real world have had to make in response to the expansion and then contractions of US power and capital. One of the core discoveries of my research is that the techniques of storytelling that post-apocalyptic novels evolved after World War II lend themselves remarkably well to the exploration of geopolitical anxiety in the 21st century. So let's turn to some of those examples right now. First off is George R. Stewart's Earth Abides. For being published in 1948, it has surprisingly little to say directly about the nuclear threat. Instead, it catalogs apocalyptic changes to the world in the near total absence of humans. The novel follows a doctoral student as he explores the United States after an epidemic disease has killed most of the population. This focal character, Isherwood Williams, survives because of a luckily timed snake bite. He's doing some of his research in the mountains, is laid out by the snake bite, and once he comes to, a disease has swept uh, across the country and killed most of the population. After describing Williams' mourning for his family, the narrator delights, though, 
in this new sense of open space. Man was gone, certainly for a while, perhaps forever. Even if some survivors were left, they would be a long time in a game of tending, obtaining supremacy. What would happen to the world and its creatures? That he was left to see. Earth Abides treats survival as an opportunity to explore the United States in the absence of humans. In one of William's many cross-country drives through the abandoned landscape of the United States, he must clear several fallen trees from the road. No one maintains the roads, and humans are apparent only in their more or less conspicuous absence. The old roads that Williams travels in Earth Abides are those of the United States at the time of the book's publication, prior to the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956 and the creation of the interstate system that readers today might imagine he uses. The novel demonstrates a cataloging impulse, which undoubtedly serves as an, as an efficient and unobtrusive tool for post-apocalyptic storytelling. The narrator's commentary is perhaps the most obvious example of this impulse. The novel interrupts first-person narration with sections that describe scenes of deteriorated U.S. infrastructure. Stewart places these sections, which are in italics, in the middle of chapters. The sections are reminiscent of John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, first published in 1939, in which mass migration is narrated from a distance in between the chapters that describe the Jode family's journey. In Earth Abides, however, these sections are clearly not about people and indeed could not occur in the presence of humans. As with dogs and cats, so also with the grasses and flowers which man had long nourished. The clover and the bluegrass withered on the lawns and the dandelions grew tall. These descriptions continue, lamenting the loss of asters, camillas, wisteria vines and rose bushes, and the replete with imagery of an imperial fall. As once when the armies of empire were shattered and the strong barbarians poured in upon the soft provincials, so now the fierce weeds pressed in to destroy the pampered nurslings of man. These in interruptions of William's story intensify the sense of world and environment as a force, even an agent in the narrative. Stewart offers ecological commentary alongside geographical observations, but Williams, the character, and the narrator make separate yet intertwined progress across the empty space of North America. The catalog functions as a kind of stitching device within the narrative discourse, tying together the impact of the absence of human activity, the journey of the observer explorer, and the commentary of the narrator. The novel places Williams crucially at the center of its narrative project. Despite the introduction of other characters, such as his eventual life partner, Emma, and the interchapters that focus on the slow deterioration of the built world, though Williams is separate from the backdrop of the post-apocalyptic setting, his impulse to catalog maintains his link to the time before the end and his intellectual investment in the post-apocalyptic world. At one point, the narrator remarks, the more Williams thought about it, the more fundamental he considered Emma's idea of keeping track of time. After all, time was history, and history was tradition, and tradition was civilization. If you lost the continuity of time, you lost something that might never be recovered. This passage offers a good example of what it means for Williams to be, effectively, the last American. Unlike the generation to follow, he remembers life before the collapse of modernity, and yet it is only a memory for him. Later in the novel, he looks on as his children fashion arrowheads from coins, and he struggles to remember what the coins were once for. In this way, Earth Abides presents a similar set of considerations that we'll find on display in The Bear. What is humanity's purpose? How are we to live out our days on a changed world? What ought to be carried forward from the past, and what can be left behind and forgotten? The science fiction critic, Eric S. Rapkin, succinctly identifies the essential, essentially political work of comparison that post-apocalyptic storytelling elicits. In Tales of the End of the World as we know it, crucial judgments arise by comparing the world destroyed with the world for which it makes room. Here, Rabkin suggests comparing the imagined world within the text 
and wants us to extend that idea, comparing it also to our own. This is because the story of the post-apocalyptic mode is a story of remainders, elements of form, style, and thematic preoccupations that persist beyond their historical context and are reworked and revalued. As may be true of any mode of writing over time, the internal transformation of the US post-apocalyptic mode of writing is in many ways the story of how old tendencies operate in new frameworks. And the best post-apocalyptic novel, novels already know this. The second uh, example I'm gonna draw on today is Octavia E. Butler's Parable of the Sower, first published in 1993. And I wanna open it with a particular scene where the character that we're following in this novel asks her stepmother about city lights. Her stepmother responds, kids today have no idea what a blaze of city lights used to be and not that long ago. Well, Amina says that she would rather have the stars and her stepmother responds, the stars are free. I'd rather have the city lights back myself. The sooner the better but we can afford the stars. This exchange highlights the importance of remainders in Butler's novel. Some characters cope by wishing for a return as the stepmother does. Though she would like the city lights back, she also rejects at least a part of the past world. The idea that they could afford the stars suggests that they could not afford electric lights. Although whether this collective pronoun we refers to the family or to the community where they live is left ambiguous. Other characters acclimatize themselves to and even affirm the changes that have taken place, as Olamina does. The infrastructure for delivering electric energy remains, though it goes unpowered. Houses stand still and provide shelter. The book opens with a scene in which characters ride their bikes away from the community to engage in target practice. New modes of social life and protocols for its stewardship emerge from the old ways of doing things. Things are different from what they were, but not that different, at least for some. Olamina lives in a walled community at a point when gasoline seems to be used solely to light fires. An arch right-wing president is in charge in the White House and company towns return to offer people shelter and food in exchange for work. The novel is epistolary, it is quite literally Olamina's diary. Readers learn about her condition of hyper-empathy, which just in passing is her capacity to feel what one perceives others to be feeling, and about life in Robledo. Everything changes halfway through the novel as it pivots from a story about the enclave to a road trip narrative. Robledo's walls are breached and Olamina is forced to grab her bug out bag and walk north on the interstate. The second half of the novel follows Olamina as she slowly builds a community around her. She becomes comfortable enough to share her developing religion of Earthseed, whose core teaching is that God is change. There are two more novels that follow this story. Parable of the Talents takes on the viewpoint of Olamina's child after the Earthseed group implodes. And Butler did not complete Parable of the Trickster before she died in 2006. Though there are many versions of the novel, many false starts among her papers in the Huntington Library in Southern California. Before I turn to the bear, I wanted to briefly call to mind a very different novel that shares some similarities with it. That is Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Though featuring a parent and a child, a trek through wilderness, and the ultimate separation of the two characters, the novel could not be more different from Prefax. The road features a blasted landscape. No animals aside from humans survive the apocalyptic event. McCarthy explores the self-destructive drives of human beings and their struggle to survive on a devastated planet. Personally, while I consider McCarthy to be an accomplished prose stylist and agree with literary critic Dan Sinekin's assessment of his skill as a writer of literary genre fiction, I actually detest this book for the way it centers white upper-class masculine fears about the end while totally relying on the labor of an absent woman. We can talk more about that in the Q&A if you like. For now, I'd like to point out that Butler's writing 
stands out as a critique that pushes back against its own literary descendants. So her Parable of the Sower critiques the road's inward-looking, self-obsessed, antisocial, masculinist hand-wringing in advance, showing that vague fears of the end of the world are most often expressed from the vantage point of the realm of power and dominance under threat. Butler's elaborations take into account the specific ways that people might mistreat but also come to rely on one another and have more to offer our understanding of catastrophe in the real wor world than the misguided fears of McCarthy's protagonist. In light of their ready response to the road, Butler's parables books complement and extend the critical concept of the remainder. They deepen the way I want to use the term. On the one hand, the road is a derivative holdover, and on the other hand, Butler's novels offer a critique of it from the past. Butler saw the encroaching crisis with clear eyes, while McCarthy cannot fathom any manner of continuance under the conditions he imagines. Parable of the Sower, in this sense, is an extrapolative text, whereas McCarthy's is a regressive one. This assessment has as much to do with the road's latent racial dynamics as it does with its troubling take on family, children, and the future. Post-apocalyptic novels feature strikingly similar characters, plots, and ways of getting something done, but the something that is accomplished is markedly different. Thankfully, Krivak's novel is one that does interesting work with what has come before. Andrew Krivak, the bear, describes a different landscape than the novels we've looked at so far. And this is where I'm going to play an audio clip, and I'm going to turn on the closed captioning. Bear is a spare and quiet novel that takes place in a distant future, yet one that is in no way dystopic, no way ruined or scorched. I hope readers will feel and embrace the simple beauty of the characters' lives and the wildness of the landscape in which they live. I modeled it after the Monadnock region, but I am sure that the immediate and elemental quality I try to evoke will resonate with communities around the country who feel a deep connection to their own wild places of mountains, deserts, lakes, oceans, parks, and gardens. I also used a... Okay, sorry for the strange cutoff at the end, just about like dialing in the right second. And I, that's where we got the full sentence that, that he was saying. Um, so Krivak lives most of the time in Summerhill, Massachusetts, but um, spends some time as well in Jaffrey um, on Thorndack Pond in the shadow of Mount Monadnock. And here he is in the cover of the book as well. Sorry, I had a fly on my glasses. And uh, here, perhaps poor planning on my part, I have a second video clip for us to watch in short succession, and then we'll return to my interpretation of the novel at hand. So I'm going to play this and then turn on closed captioning. The last two were a girl and her father who lived along the old eastern range on the side of a mountain they called the mountain that stands alone. The men had come there with a woman when they were young and built a house out of timber, stones pulled from the ground and mortar they made with a mix of mud and sand. It was set halfway up the mountain slope and looked out onto a lake ringed with birch trees and blueberry bushes that ripened in summer with great bunches of fruit the girl and her father would pick as the two floated along the shore in a canoe. From a small window in front of the house, the glass, a gift the woman's parents had given to her after having received it themselves from the generation before, so precious a thing had it become as the skill for making it was lost and forgotten. The girl could see eagles catching fish in the shallows of an island that rose from the middle of the lake and hear the cries of loons in the morning while her breakfast cooked over a hearth fire. In winter, the snows began not long after the autumn equinox and still visited the mountain months after the spring. Storms lasted for days and weeks at a time, drifts climbing up against the house in varying paths as deep as some trees grew high. Often the man had to wade for firewood or trudge out to his tool shed at the edge of the forest with a rope tied around his waist. But when the wind settled, the skies cleared and the low sun shone again, the man would wrap the young girl warm and tighten a pack, walk out into the stillness of winter and float on snowshoes made of ash limbs and rawhide down to the frozen lake, where the two would spend the day fishing for trout and perch to the ice. Snow covered so much of the girl's world from mountaintop to lake that for almost half the year, all she could see when she looked out that window was a landscape at rest beneath a blanket of white. 
And yet no matter how long winter lasted, spring followed, its arrival soft and somehow surprising like the notes of birdsong upon waking or the tap of water slipping in a droplet from a branch to the ground. As the snow melted, black rocks, gray lichen and brown leaf cover emerged from the once uniform palette of the forest floor and the thin silvery outlines of trees began to brighten with leaves of green against the groupings of hemlock and pine. Those were the days when the girl left the house in the morning with her father and studied a new world that pushed up from the dirt of the forest and emerged from the water at the edge of the lake days in which she lay on the ground beneath a warm sun and wondered if world and time itself were like the hawk and eagle soaring above her in long arcs she knew were only part of their flight for they must have begun and returned to some place as if yet unseen by her some place as of yet unknown this is how the novel opens in many ways the bear is a story of abundance it is about the return of the sacred. The girl develops a knowing understanding that she is nothing more, nothing less than her relations with the biophysical environment. It's interesting that uh, Krivak in the first clip used the word wild. Um, and I'm just noticing this as I'm listening to the clip. Uh, I think nature is the wrong word to describe the setting of the bear. The novel makes a subtle inter intervention in how readers think about the biophysical world. The cycle of the seasons and days, the sensory experience of light, bird song, and lapping water of the lake, the patterns of animal movement, all of these elements describe an ecosystem, a concatenation of living and non-living beings. Nature is a word with an intellectual history that predates the Enlightenment and carries with it implications of the separation of human animals from the biophysical world on which they depend for survival. Krivak's intervention here is a subtle one that presents the chance for readers to reconsider their ecological relationships at a time when rampant de development threatens the very relations that sustain us. I also gesture to Krivak's use of the word studied. This novel is a novel of learning. Readers follow the girl as she learns how to live in a good way. When the girl is six, her father walks with her up the mountain to visit her mother's grave. This trek becomes a yearly summer solstice ritual for them. The girl learns to read, turning to poets such as Homer, Virgil, Hilda Doolittle, and Wendell Berry. I'll note that the cabin reading is not the expected Reader's Digest, Uncle John's Bathroom Reader, pulp novels, and so on. Instead, we have the poets who wrote Iliad, Odyssey, Aeneid, Hermione, and Sea Garden. On the nose is Barry, a poet, but he's also the author of The Unsettling of America and a lifelong Christian environmentalist. Krivak sets up a comparison here. The girl reads H.D. in the way H.D. may have read Homer and Virgil. Readers get a clue about just how long it's been since the 20th century when H.D. and Barry were alive. What's more, the pulp paper of Reader's Digest and paperback novels deteriorates more rapidly than the quality stock used for classics and literary fiction. The persistence of some titles here indicates that others went the way of Firestarter or aged into illegibility. The girl is seven when she and her father encounter a bear near the lake. Her father tells her a story of a bear who keeps his promise and protects a village from a greedy feudal lord. The feudal setting of the father's story is noteworthy as a point in world history when people began to be separated from the seasonal rhythms of subsistence farming. The intervention of the bear stands in for violent peasant uprisings to retake the commons and their hard-earned crops. The novel makes such a reading available, though it chooses another interpretive route by emphasizing the role of the bear. The next lesson arrives in the form of goose gander and goslings. The birds take up residence on the lake and the gander attacks the girl when she tries to fish nearby them. This encounter is key to the girl's education and the second half of the book. The father insists the girl kill the gander. The last two were a girl and her father. There we go. You know, they're not going away, he said. So either we let them be and fish elsewhere on the lake until autumn, or you hunt them, just as you did in the fall when you went out for deer. The girl does as her father suggests, but in retrospect develops a divergent way of thinking from her father's approach to survival. 
I wish I could have talked to those geese, told them why we didn't want them making a mess on our beach, why there were better places to raise their young. Maybe they would have understood, or maybe they would have taught me something about them, like that bear who helped the people in the story you told me. This confession sets up the girl's change in attitude in the second half of the book. It establishes her as a viable member of the biophysical environment. She's open to her relations and hopes to learn from them. It's not that she's worthy of those relationships. Instead, it's more like she's tuned to them. Seasons change for the pair, and soon enough, the girl is 12. Their salt supply runs low, and the father plans a trip to the sea. It's on this journey that the novel hinges. The movement away from the cabin presents circumstances that divide the characters. Moreover, it establishes a new opportunity for the girl to learn and from new teachers. The closest the novel gets to the blasted city streets of the generic post-apocalyptic setting comes in the following description. And I'm just gonna let you know, I altered some of the paragraphs here, uh, the breaks, you know, I combined sentences in order to fit the text better on the slides. Setting moon and rising sun balanced on the horizon when they crested a hill and came to an expansive dwarf drumlin and glen was rife with rangy grass and flowering weeds that looked like no meadow or lakeside the girl had ever seen. So uniform and unbroken was the landscape in its constant undulation. The man picked handfuls of young pigweed shoots growing out of the ground and placed them in his pack. Then the two of them hiked up a knoll, surveyed the view before them and sat down to eat. The girl was tired from having walked all night and she wished she could sleep, but her father seemed animated by this place. He said to her, when I came here with my father, there were still some walls rising out of the ground. Not much of them, but visible. With your mother more, more than 10 years ago now, there were bricks and glass in the dirt, but nothing standing. Now it looks like this. The girl stared at the stretch of emptiness. Walls for what? She asked. Houses once, bigger than ours, row after row of them, if you can imagine. That's all I can do. I've never seen such a thing. She remained gazing out at the land. Then she said, the others? A long time ago, he said. For a while, the girl just listened to the strange forest-like stillness of the place and began to doze. When she heard the man unshoulder his pack and start walking off the knoll into a large depression in the ground beneath, below them, she stood up fast and shouted, no. The man stopped and turned. What's wrong? Don't, don't go. We don't know what's down there. The man stood on the grassy slope. I don't think there's anything down there to be known, he said, but there may be something we can use. He continued along the slope of the hill and the girl watched him as he slowed, walked carefully along the perimeter of a hollow, then disappeared over the side. She stood waiting, trying not to look at the fear in front of her like an oversized gander when the man climbed out of the hollow and walked back to the top of the knoll. He held a piece of glass filthy with mud in his hand and said, this will make a good arrowhead for small game. He showed it to the girl, then opened his pack, took out a piece of leather, which he wrapped around the glass and placed it next to the fishing line. Come on, he said. There might be something else we could find. This place brings something to life in the father. He looks to the past in a way that is inaccessible to the girl. He is about to compare the changes. He is able to compare the changes and those changes let the reader know that even when the father was young, this place was claimed by flora and fauna. The girl cannot imagine what these walls would be for, why there would be so many of them. In fact, she says that the landscape looks unnatural. Uh, there were no way that she's seen before. The father can't imagine, but he can imagine, I apologize, yet hasn't seen. He has inherited some knowledge from his father, some stories perhaps of what came before. The simile here is telling too. Prevac writes, for a while the girl just listened to this strange forest-like stillness of the place and began to doze. This is a character-inflected comparison. Her understanding comes from an experience of the forest, yet this was once the site of a city. So here is uh, the former colonial center of Ross Island. And I chose this image because it's of a former British colony. Sites such as this one 
in the novel already exist and are often connected to colonial flight, capital flight, or disaster. Um, this is a view of the abandoned, abandoned of an abandoned fishing village in China and its area. So it's looking down at these buildings that are overtaken by moss and green, and it seems to be a little bit more like what the characters encounter in the novel. The father treats these areas as other characters in the post-apocalyptic novels do, salvage sites. These storehouses of ancient commodities stand ready to have their goods taken up again by the last two humans. The girl's trepidation signals her divergence from her father's approach to survival. The novel plays with a dynamic often found in post-apocalyptic stories. It's what the late Lauren Berlant would describe as a kind of cruel optimism, which is when something you desire is actually an obstacle to your flourishing. Berlant offers a compelling observation for this moment in the novel, writing people born into unwelcoming worlds and unreliable environments have a different response to the new precarities than do people who presume they would be protected. Who experiences crisis as ongoing and who regards it as a momentary lapse? The novel differentiates the father and the daughter ultimately by leading the father to his death. He explores an abandoned basement and is bitten by something in the dark. He eventually succumbs to a fever, leaving the girl alone, the last human. This death marks the turning point of the novel and the flourishing of a new way of life for the girl, who discovers a kind of sacred connection to the land. She finds new teachers who speak to her directly as the bear in the story her father told, as she'd wished the geese could. Soon after her father's death, the titular bear comes to take care of her. She also learns from a cougar, an eagle, and the land itself. She survives winter and lives out her days. At first, I struggled to interpret this work as post-apocalyptic. It relies on a distant future and avoids overturning the trope of the last people left on Earth in the traditional sense. Um, usually, they're not really the last people, right? There's other people. that They can rebuild society or something. The post-apocalypse isn't really about the end, it's about a new beginning. Instead, the social connections that emerge are with the relations who were there already, the animals and trees, the wind and the water. This is where my growing sense of the book as an important contribution to the post-apocalyptic mode of storytelling comes in. Whether we look at the recent history of US dominance or its colonial past, humanity lives with the still reverberating consequences of many apocalyptic ruptures. As settler scholar James Berger puts it, for American Indians, the worst catastrophe imaginable has already happened. Meanwhile, as settler scholar John Reeder writes, environmental devastation, species extinction, enslavement, plague, and genocide, these are not merely nightmares morbidly fixed upon by science fiction writers and readers, but are rather the bare historical record of what happened to non-European people and lands after being discovered by Europeans and integrated into European political and economic arrangements from the 15th century to the present. Berger and Reeder vividly illustrate how apocalyptic writing, especially by white authors, tends to recast colonial histories in the image of future fears. Moreover, Indigenous scholars have long been arguing that Indigenous people have already experienced an ongoing apocalyptic event. Potawatomi scholar Kyle White argues that the Indigenous people are currently living in their ancestors' dystopia today. In the Anthropocene, some Indigenous people already inhabit what our ancestors would have likely characterized as a dystopian future. So we consider the future from what we believe is already a dystopia, as strange as that may sound to some readers. Nishinaabe author Wapgishig Rice, uh, his novel Moon of the Crusted Snow, takes this point head on. The novel flips the post-apocalyptic script by focusing on how a reserve of Anishinaabe people survived the winter without regular shipments of food and fuel in remote northern Ontario. The elder Eileen explains to some younger characters that this moment is not the apocalypse. Our world isn't ending. It already ended. It ended when the Zagnash came into the original home down south on that bay and took it from us. That was our world. When the Zagnash cut down all the trees and fished all the fish and forced us out of there. That's when our world ended. This is not our homeland, but we have had to adapt. And luckily, we already know how to hunt and live on the land. We learned to live here. This brings me to the crux of my reading of The Bear. 
its interest in the return of the sacred of a real honoring of the relationships that sustain the characters of a deep sustaining listening to non-human animals are all deeply important and necessary parts of a radical environmentalism. They seem to be in line with decolonial projects as well, yet the novel passes over the history of colonization and the ongoing apocalypse of settlement and genocide on Turtle Island. In this way, it can be said to participate in the erasure of indigenous knowledge and life ways. So my least charitable reading of the novel treats it as feeding a settler fantasy of somehow managing to become indigenous at the same time that the political problems of the US are all avoided by blanketing New Hampshire and vegetation and filling it with wildlife. On the other hand, my most open-hearted reading would characterize the novel as a work in progress, a step towards some deep healing that is needed by us all. And I wanna be clear here, both claims about the novel are true. It effaces Indigenous people in their history, even as it takes the post-apocalyptic mode in a vital, thoughtful direction. Then importantly, we can decide how to read the novel and what importance to draw from it. I hope those of you who read it or have read the book take some time to reflect on this provocation. I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the Q&A. Uh, for now, I'm just going to take a minute to recommend um, some reading. This is the final piece. Um, for those who haven't read Zone 1, uh, but are interested in uh, sort of unique, quirky takes on the zombie uh, zombie storytelling. This um, features a strange condition that script most of the world. People become scales, essentially the living, living dead and travel to moments and places of strong association. So they sort of stop in a park and sit on a park bench and that's where a person will be for weeks. Um, the focal character Mark Spitz is part of Project Phoenix and works with a team to clear uh, New York City high rises of the living dead so that it might be inhabited once more. Next up, um, Cherie Dimeline's The Marrow Thieves. In this, white settlers have lost the ability to dream, and they harvest the marrow of Indigenous peoples to restore themselves. The main character, Frankie, joins up with a group of Indigenous renegades hiding out from the state's forces. Um, so again, you have that sort of travel narrative built in. You have the sort of Bildungsroman of the main character learning. Um, it's great. It's great. Uh, Next, I would recommend uh, Severance by Ling Ma, which follows Candace Chen, a newcomer from Fuzhou province, known for manufacturing industry, who finds ways to blend into New York as a Bible product coordinator. Um, Chen runs a blog called New York Ghost, where she posts photos of the city as the Shen fever empties the city streets. And uh, it's a, it's a, Amazing, amazing post-apocalyptic novel that I would recommend. Those three. Um, I think it's time for questions. Uh, if you don't get your question answered today, feel free to go to brentryanbellamy.com. You can get in touch with me through my website. Thank you, Brent. This is really uh, fabulous. And um, I'm going to give people a couple of seconds to start putting questions in. Uh, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A um, feature in Zoom. Uh, that way we can make sure we keep track of ones we're able to get to and ones we're not. Um, while I give you a moment or two to, um, to get some questions in, I'm going to um, actually promote a couple of other things coming up with the big read. So if you are interested in this book and all the exciting things happening, we encourage you to join us on October 14th at 2 p.m. where we will have Andrew Krivak uh, come to the uh, New Hampshire stage in Concord. Uh, we will be live streaming it and uh, there will be an opportunity to, get to attend in person at two o'clock on October 14th. Uh, we also have another follow-up Humanities at Home, which is going to be back on Friday, November 3rd at 5 p.m. with Finding Your Way, The Night Sky, uh, which is presented by Midge Goldberg, uh, a poet, um, talking about the ways that we have looked at the night sky and talked about the night sky, which is an important element in the book as well. So we hope you will join us for those. Um, and we hope you will be, uh, you know, sending in your questions. Um, I do also, I'm sorry, this is the couple of other quick things that I can also, while you are getting some questions in, um, do also want to thank again the National Endowment for the Humanities, which has made this program possible, as well as um, audience members and community members like you. So if you do want to find out more, um, newhampshirehumanities.org, it's the place to go. And um, 
one of the other details that I am supposed to remind you of is that we do really rely on your uh, survey answers. Uh, so please, uh, um, when you get an email after the program, take a couple of minutes, fill that out, send it to us. We do really read everyone and we really do appreciate it because it's how we try to make our programs better. Um, we have a uh, question coming in from Quentin uh, in New Hampshire. Um, there are such differences in the way climate is considered uh, or ignored in various novels and movies you mentioned. Do you care to comment? Thanks for the question, Quentin. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one thing that jumps to mind is Octavia E. Butler's parables novels are often credited with just sort of like their prescience, right? So uh, an example that I didn't really exfoliate all that much is that in the parable of the talents, one of the slogans of a uh, presidential candidate is make America great again. Um, it's literally there in the book. Um, and, and the other thing is her kind of take on uh, the uptick in turbulent weather events uh, to tie to climate change. What's interesting is um, Butler herself talked about just reading the paper every day and attending to what was happening. And I think there's a way that we lose sight of the long history of these so-called crises. Uh, they actually have been happening for a long time and Butler's just attuned to them. So then when we read it today, it feels like it's, she knew something ahead of time when she was paying attention in a certain way. So that's one thing I'll say. The other thing is there's a, a great uh, provocative book uh, by Mark Gould called The Anthropocene Unconscious. And his claim is like, look, what if we just think everything is actually about climate change? Um, and he reads uh, science fiction. He looks at cinema. And perhaps the wildest example he uh, of an interpretation he offers is of the Fast and Furious franchise, um, which uh, simultaneously kind of gives us the celebration of car culture, but then also a, the, the utopian form of the family of found family, uh, right? Um, and so the idea there is like, sure, a novel might explicitly say it's about the environment or climate change, but it might not actually offer us too many tools to think through the problems posed by climate change. Whereas something that's just about what it's about may offer more in the way of um, critical material to, to dig into, right? Uh, so that's maybe a, an academic point about how and when climate gets considered. Um, also, the point is sort of to say, like, it's up to us to kind of push that question, right? And I mean, that's essentially what my reading of The Bear does is it's not that I'm sort of saying, oh, you didn't talk about uh, Indigenous people. And so this is bad. It's like, this is so close to an Indigenous worldview that I would, I, it feels like it's an unspoken thing. And I'd be very curious to hear uh, Krivak speak to that um, in some way. Uh, anyhow, I hope that's, I hope that's helpful. You had mentioned your critique of McCarthy. Um, the mother is also absent in the bear. And so how does Krivak avoid having the man rely on her labor in the way you critique McCarthy? Great question. Um, in McCarthy, the the mother is a kind of ghost that haunts the present and the man actually has to leave the photograph of her behind and um there's this thing that this line near the end of the book that's about fire being the fire that gets talked about in in the road all the time getting passed on from father to son and it totally effaces the sort of reproductive role of uh the woman in that um novel in a way that uh Krivak doesn't do like the mother in um the bear is very much a character and very much a part of the story and the raising of of this of this kid um but it's more than that too because the thing about McCarthy's novel is it's actually kind of insisting that they carry on and that a new generation come about on this planet, which is basically uninhabitable. 
uh, it's insisting that we need to survive and reproduce. And like, that's the only way forward. Whereas Griffith's novel is actually about, it's like the return of the sacred and then kind of like the fading away of humanity. Um, so it's not as future obsessed in the way that a lot of post-apocalyptic novels are. And I find that of unique, <laughs> actually. Most, most post-apocalyptic novels are about sort of restarting the social and getting things going again, right? So um, can we have, do we have time for one more question for you? I don't wanna, we're about to hit six o'clock. Can, yeah. can I get one more in? Um, yeah, absolutely. Really interesting question um, that the examples of views from Krivak and other writers uh, were uh, seem to place the apocalypse and, and post-apocalyptic literature in North America. Mm -hmm. uh, are there examples from other locations and other cultures? And if so, how do they compare with North American examples? Oh, what a what a wonderful um, question! I would uh, say yes, absolutely. There are examples, um, and I mean, it, it, I mean, Cherie Dimaline might be a good example here as a Métis author um, who uh, is writing writing from where I'm from, a country currently known as Canada, uh, and insists that she's not a Canadian author too. Uh, interestingly. Uh, and rightly, perhaps. So there, th there's that sort of line, right? Um, to sort of pick up on the theme of the talk. Uh, and and Rice's Moon of the Crusted Snow would be another example of an indigenous novel that's engaged with the genre, but it's like, actually, we would, I would write this a totally different way, right? Here's how it is when it's set on the reserve. Um, but I would point to uh, The Waste Tide uh, by Chen Ki Fan. That novel um, is, is kind of about the accumulation of toxic electronics. And it, there's a, it's a set on an island just off of China and um, it follows the people there who are kind of dealing with that. Uh, it's not considered a post-apocalyptic novel, although it certainly is about the transformation of a, of a space into something that's completely unrecognizable. And that would be um, Abdel Rahman Munib's Cities of Salt. Um, it's about the uh, development of the oil industry in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, there are some good Russian examples too. The Slinks, for example. Um, I'm sure the Strugatsky brothers have a post-apocalyptic novel. Uh, you also have the cozy apocalypse of like uh, British, British post-apocalyptic novels like um, Wyndham Lewis, like the Day of the Triffids kind of thing where there's a big interruption, but then you kind of get to live quietly in the countryside after all um yeah and there there are many uh, other examples and they they work differently i mean my take is to think about what's the us post apocalyptic novel doing um and i think the examples of whitehead um and ma show that there's a kind of 21st century pivot in what the the novel is kind of up to well, Gal, we thank you all for joining us tonight. We thank Dr. Bellamy for change, uh, changing our perspective on this book. And uh, we hope that you will join us next month. We will see you then. Thanks, everyone.